All right. And so I want to share my screen with you. Amen. And so I'm going to have to say share what? Okay. So give me one second on that, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. All right. And bang. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can y'all see that? No, you can't, huh? Okay, all right, so when I say share. Now we. Okay, y'all got to help me, okay? Y'all excuse me on that, please forgive me. Stop the share. And this should be what I wanna do. Can y'all see this? No? No, no sir. sir. Okay, very good, but I, I do have it open now. So if I hit share again, there it is. Okay, good. No, sir. Uh, hey, yes. sir. Okay, okay it's, on, it's on now. All right, well, good, good, good. I wanna deal with tonight a new order. And uh, way up here, I started dealing with the priesthood and I had all kinds of good stuff that I wanted to show you. I've thrown, literally thrown this stuff away because I wanted to get to this here uh, with the new order <clears throat> and it's good stuff. Okay, so the first thing is, is we got Israel is in trouble. That's, that's how this new order uh, is going to come about. Uh, Samuel, the child, receives a prophetic word for the house of Eli. Even as a child, this young prophet, he could be a standard that we can teach prophets from because from his youth, not one of his words falls to the ground. So in 1 Samuel 3, 10 to 14, it says, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. This is the third time now that the Lord is saying, Samuel, Samuel. Uh, then Samuel answered, speak for thy servant heareth. And you've heard the teaching about a lot of times the DNA son, the father's voice sounds like his spiritual father, the person that has influence over him. And the Lord said to Samuel, verse 11, behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Y'all hear this prophetic word? And in that day, I will perform against Eli. What? All things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin I will also make an end for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for what the iniquity or iniquitous patterns, which he knoweth because his sons, here's why, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. That's why God is mad. Okay. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli, I've sworn that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offerings forever. So in other words, your high priesthood and all that you've learned about sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, I'm not forgiving you. You don't get that because you, your sons have done such a horrible thing that I, I have no respect and no forgiveness for these boys. So then in 1 Samuel 4, 3, you're gonna see that there's something that's going to take place. I'm skipping a lot of scripture here to bring us to a place where uh, there's a war that's gonna take place. Okay, and these are the days of Samuel. Watch what I'm going to do with this. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, wherefore had the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? So they've run into the Philistines. The Philistines put a whipping on them and they said, let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us that when it cometh among us, 
it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, where did they get that from? So point number one, Shiloh was the resting place of the tabernacle. You could find out that that's where it rested in Joshua 1 and 8. Let me say something to you guys quickly because I know you are students of the word. Listen to me carefully. Um, you remember how in the Levitical priesthood, which is going to be all Old Testament, how when the tabernacle moved, it moved because there was a pillar of fire by night or a cloud by day. They followed that thing all in their wilderness encounters, right? When they found their resting place, when all the land was being parceled out, the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle rested and you don't have any recordings anymore of the cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night leading them through what? The wilderness. They're no longer in the wilderness. They've, they've made it to where they're parceling out the land to all the uh, 11 tribes of Israel minus one, 12 minus one. So Levi doesn't get any land. And what takes place, ladies and gentlemen, is so it, the ark is in Shiloh. You can see it in Joshua 18, 1, where it rests there. And that's the resting place. Actually, that's what Shiloh means, resting place. Shiloh is the place where the ark, the tabernacle is set up and Levi is functioning and operating there. Do y'all, are y'all with me on that? Do y'all understand what's going on? So there's no more going out or in the tabernacle. The tribes are surrounding that thing. You know, the, all the little cities and towns and areas that they've inherited, they're sitting in their inheritance in the whole nine yards. And so now uh, there comes a day where the Philistines come and the Philistines uh, uh, are ready to make war with the children of Israel. And so the people are saying, we're over here in this particular location, and I'll show you. And uh, let's go get the ark because we lost a battle. We went into battle, and this is after, you know, we've wrestled with Samuel, and I'll show you that, that we want a king. And they don't understand that because of all the failures of the kings and whatnot, that God is not with them anymore. And so they're just having church. They're just doing stuff in their own strength and they're not even contacting uh, the high priest necessarily to inquire of the Lord for them. Y'all with me? So look at what we have here. All right, uh, so this is my second point. This is the place where the ark left the tabernacle structure and never returned based on this scripture right here. Again, let's read it. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel, the people and the elders said, wherefore had the Lord, they blaming the Lord, smitten us today before the Philistines. Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, where? Out of Shiloh unto us. Where are they getting this idea from? That when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no recordings of that ever happening. Let me go to the third point. The presence of God, the Ark, is no longer, uh-oh, behind veils. They go get it 50 miles away, a trip to Baton Rouge. They go and get that thing and they bring it to this certain location where the war is taking place. Now, the other point is, is that the final point is much destruction takes place because men do not know how to handle the presence of God as a result of that. So in 1 Samuel 4, 4 and 5, it says, so the people. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen. I would have thought that they would say, so Levi, 
the high priest. Somebody says, so the people sent to Shiloh. Watch it when people start to run the ministry. That they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims, and the two, look, look who's leading it. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God, right? And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, hey, the church shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. My point, without inquiring of the Lord, the children of Israel superstitiously, like a lucky charm, assumed that by having the ark present, they would have God's endorsement to win the battle. That's what they're saying. Not talking to God now. They're not talking to God. Let's just put a cross in our neck. Let's just put a, 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 a bumper sticker on our car. Let's hang a cross on our rear view mirror. Let's have some type of symbol. Let's put a statue in our front yard. Whatever we can do, this is, it, was, it was supposed to be symbolic that we know God and God is with us. Well, not so. Now, 1 Samuel 4, 10 and 11, it says, and the Philistines fought, and again, Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, uh-oh, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, by the word of the prophet Samuel, was slain. The young boy prophesied all this stuff taking place. So point number one, in 1 Samuel 5, 1 to 12, the Lord deals with the cities of the Philistines. You should read that. For seven months, it says that in 6, 1, 1 Samuel 6, 1. The Philistines make a new cart and tie two young cows to drive it, verse 7. The ark heads to the border of Judah, ladies and gentlemen, and the southern border of Dan, which is assigned to the Levites. That thing went straight back to the Levites. It didn't turn to the right or to the left. Those cows by the Holy Ghost went straight back to the people who's supposed to handle it. Verse six, uh, chapter six, verse 12. And then in verse 15, the Levites take charge of the ark again, right? Now, in uh, chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, and the men of Kerjat Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified, they did a work, Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So he's became, Eliezer is a priest. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjat Jerem uh, that the time was long. Look at the scripture. For it was what? 20 years, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the scripture. 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented the Lord. Now look at what this really means. The ark stayed at Kerjat Jerem uh, for 20 years until Samuel addresses the children of Israel to repent in 1 Samuel 7, 3 to 6. And they do. They really repent. For 100 years, the ark remained in Kerjat Jerem. Lord, my goodness, 100 years, y'all. A long time of people so-called having church and declaring that the presence of the Lord is in other, in other places besides this, they don't honor the presence. They don't respect the presence. They could care less about the presence. They're just being religious. So the ark was not sought the entire reign of Saul with his heart, really. He had no interest in God's presence except for the battle in 1 Samuel 14, 18, where the ark was used as a traditional symbol or a rabbit's foot. Saul inquired, 
he inquired because he felt he had to. He was just being religious. He just went through the motions and the whole nine yards, okay? So that's amazing. And if you know the life of Saul, you can see how that all falls into play. Now, uh, the sins of the fathers real quick. In 1 Samuel 8, 1 to 3, it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judge over Israel. Look, their names. The name of the firstborn was Joel and the name of his second, Abia. They were judges in Beersheba. And look, like Hophni and Phinehas, and his sons walked not in his ways. You mean holy Samuel? You mean the great prophet whose words never fall to the ground, who had a powerhouse ministry and people feared him when he came into town? When people came into his region, they began to prophesy like Saul and lay naked in the street all day long because they just came into this man's orbit. But they turned aside his sons after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. You know, that's so that happens so much in leaders' families, where somehow the PKs just go off or there's always some kind of limp that we got or some kind of thing we're ashamed of that happens that it's all throughout the Bible where we have these mishaps and these leaders' kids that just don't get it. So even though Samuel is the national prophet whose words never fall to the ground because his spiritual father, Eli, because listen, when he dreamed, he was having the Lord call him. He says, my father, my father. So that was Eli was Samuel's spiritual father. He did not win the parenting battle. The spiritual son, Samuel, great in gifting, is defeated also in the same place of parenting. I'm going to table the sins of the fathers for another day. But I just wanted you to see that you know, when it comes to spiritual fathers, uh, the, the father's weaknesses are your weaknesses as sons and his strengths are your strengths as well. So when choosing fathers, that's a critical thing uh, to look at and make sure that the Lord is leading you to do that. The next thing is the new kingdom, new man. New kingdom, new man, 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14. It says, and Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel for how long? Forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. And look at the prophecy. The Lord had sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord had commanded him to be captain over his people. Why? Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Amen? Can y'all see this? All right. So uh, now, uh, 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that's David, in the midst of his brethren. And listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. He's anointed, he's ordained. So listen to this, this great prophet who is known that when you come into his orbit, troops of men prophesied when they came down the lineage of Samuel and, e and Elijah and Elisha, when the, the, their orbit was so powerful that when people came near these men, they would begin to prophesy. Proph Saul, when he came into their presence, just began to prophesy so heavily that they said, is Saul among the prophets? This is what this man's mantle brought. This is what the, the anointing was. It was so strong on his life as a prophet that people prophesied and acted like prophets when they came into his presence. So Samuel rose up and he went to Ramah, right? 
A lot of good stuff about Samuel, ladies and gentlemen. He is a premier prophet to study, okay? So a glimpse at Samuel mentoring David. I have this here for a reason. In 1 Samuel 19, 18, it says, so David fled because now Saul has been chasing him because Saul understands that a prophetic word from Samuel does not fall to the ground. So I've got to interrupt this thing and kill this boy because he said he's going to be the next king. I don't want nobody to be the next king. I want to have all power forever. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to, to Ramah and look and told him all that Saul had done. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. That's, that's some interesting stuff here. So how long, how long did this take place? The Bible doesn't tell us, but they dwelt in Naoth for a season. So David is spending time with this powerhouse prophet. And so I believe that on this visit with Samuel, in addition to 16.1, uh, when Samuel anointed David, the encounter, impact, influence, and part, impartation that David experienced with Samuel, the prophet priest, ladies and gentlemen, he's a prophet priest, would have lasting effects on how David saw God through Samuel. So Samuel's salt made David thirsty for more of God. I declare in the name of Jesus that our salt makes people more thirsty for God. This man impacted. I pray that you will have impact on people's lives when they come into your orbit that they will know that you're not just average people, but like this great prophet, like Elijah, like Elisha, when people came into their orbit, they knew that they had been in the presence of a man of God, amen? So we see that, look at this one, look at this jewel that I found. It says uh, in 1 Chronicles 9, 22 to 24, this is a jewel, I've never saw this before. It says, all these which were chosen to be porters in the gates were 212. These were reckoned by their genealogy in their villages, whom David and Samuel the seer did ordain and set in their office. So David and, and Samuel are together erecting again the tabernacle structure and how it's supposed to flow, go read the top of the chapter and you'll see the Levites are putting their place, everything is put in place. And these two, David is right there with Samuel doing this. Look, look, ladies and gentlemen, look at what they're doing. They ordained in their office and set their office. So they and the children uh, in the, had the oversight of the gates of the house of the Lord, namely the house of the tabernacle by wards in four quarters where the porters toward the east, west, north, and south. You could read that chapter and see this amazing stuff as Samuel is mentoring David in the tabernacle. So David is learning priesthood. I never saw that. But this is where David starts to get all this stuff and he's walking with Samuel who offers sacrifices and because Saul thought he could do it, he got cursed and his kingdom was stripped away from him. Y'all remember that? But what, 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 why was Samuel upset? Because Saul was not qualified to do the priest function, but Samuel was. Remember, Samuel slept with the priest in their house. They took him in. His mother brought him there and set him in the house of the Lord with the Levitical priesthood, right? So here we are, David is getting a piece of it. David is learning from Samuel and seeing how this holy man walks. He's watching him. David is a prophet as well. That stuff rubbed off of him. So David is prophet, priest, and king, ladies and gentlemen. But he's being mentored by this powerhouse prophet, Samuel. 
he finally finds a father because Saul only threw javelins at him. That was supposed to be a father figure to him. He also had other prophets like Gad that was there as well, helping to mentor, but Samuel literally fathered this man, the great David, right? So a brief view, uh, view into David's life, I wanna to touch on that. Again, I repeat, 100 years before David, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, which was relocated at Shiloh, the place of rest, and they took it and brought it to the field of the battlefield of Aphek. That's where the fight was taking place. Here is the effect that David and that Samuel had on David. David saw Samuel offering sacrifices as a priest on several occasions. In 2 Samuel 6, 14, it says, and David, look at what, what, look at what effect it has. It says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. A linen ephod. Now, it says here in 1 Samuel 23, 9 to 12, Here's an example of David functioning with the ephod of a priest. It says, David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. In other words, give it to me because I know what to do with it. And David said, oh Lord, he didn't say Abiathar, inquire of the Lord for me. That's what they would say. Inquire of the Lord for us if we're supposed to do this. No, David said what the priest is supposed to say and how the priest is supposed to function. David said, oh Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul intends to come and destroy the city of Keilah on my account. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord, God of Israel, I beseech you, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Quite simple. Then David asked, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into Saul's hand? The Lord said, they will deliver you up. So you can see here in many examples where David inquired of the Lord. So he had learned from Samuel that he had a certain level of access. Samuel did not, I don't believe, answered all the questions because he was strong under the Levitical priesthood. But David, the prophetic word, what's the prophetic word that, 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 that's over David's life? God says, I'm going to get a man that's going to be after my heart. So God is already prophesying that this man is going to be different. He's going to learn mysteries about wanting me more than anything else. He's after my heart. He's after my heart. And so within that prophecy, you see that David has a heart to know God. So when you go read the Psalms now, I quoted a couple of them early, as the deer panted after the water brooks. So my soul is thirsting after the one thing that I've inquired and I've always wanted to know of the Lord that, that I might inquire of in his temple, right? David had a yearning. The sweet psalmist of Israel had a yearning to know God a yearning to be in his presence. And he was wanting to know, why can't I be in his presence? Why just one man can get to see him once a year? How come we can't see him every day? How come I can't worship him and love him? Ah, something's happening. That's happening in David's mind. And so look at what we have in 2 Samuel 6, 15 to 19. So David and all the house of Israel what did they do? They brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting 
and with the sound of the trumpet. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me on the screen for a second. You never saw any of this in the Levitical priesthood. What were they doing? Shouting. Show me where they did that with the tabernacle of Moses. And what else? And with the sound of the trumpet. So when you're going to hear us talking about, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, look at the verbs here as to what David was doing, and that's what God wants restored. That's what the tabernacle of David is. It's a, 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 a tabernacle system of worshiping and praising under the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. David is doing, a, as I shared with you guys before, he's doing a Deuteronomy 29, 29, which should be a key scripture for yourself because it says the secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things that are revealed or uncovered or revelated to an individual is for him and his children after them. So they might learn to do the will of the Lord. So it's critical. David stepped into revelation. God wanted David to understand how to access his presence. So this is what David is doing. And it pleases God. Verse 16, and as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, the Saul system, the Saul system, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window, the religious system, and saw the King David. What was he doing? Tabernacle of David, leaping and dancing before the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the tabernacle of David that's been broken down. I'll show you that in a couple of seconds. And she, the Saul system, despised him in her heart. What you doing dancing? What you doing lifting your hands? What you doing shouting? You ain't supposed to be doing that in church. That's what's happening here. And it says in verse 17, and they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of what? The tabernacle that David had pitched for it. David built one. And David offered burnt offerings. Look, look, at, look, David is doing the work of the priest. He offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Where? Before the Lord. Before the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Not, not offerings of... Uh, for sin and death and dying, forgiveness, mercy. No, peace offerings, burnt offerings of all kinds, celebratory. And as soon as David had made an end of offering, burnt offerings and peace offerings, what did he do as a priest? Different, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he, dwelt, he dealt among all the people, look at what the kingdom system does, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to women, the women as men, uh-oh, women and men in ministry, the ministry wants to bless them too, to everyone, provision is what the kingdom brings, a cake of bread, in a good piece of piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. Bread and wine, ladies and gentlemen, and meat. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. They experienced the kingdom of God with worship, praise, and provision, inclusion of the women and the men. This is another system. Can y'all hear me? It's another system. It's not the Levitical system. Trust me, the Levites are tripping right now watching David do this, but he's the king. So he has the authority to command them and they have to follow. This is powerful stuff. This is powerful. David is connected to the throne. He is the throne and he loves God. And God sits on a throne. So he now has the actual presence of the Lord and he builds a tent for it in his city. Uh, what is the tabernacle of David? Here it is, a couple of scriptures again, Amos 9, 11. 
in that day, a prophetic word, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, because it fell, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Is it a house? Is it a physical structure? No, it's a people. Acts 15, look in the book of Acts 15, they quoted, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Everything you see David doing is now the order of David's tabernacle. God says, I'm going to raise that thing up. That's what's going to end that day in the last days, these days, I'm going to raise it up. So I got a little picture, right? They had so many elaborate pictures when I was searching for pictures and whatnot. This simple little drawing was the best one because it just shows it. It's in a little simple tent and there's the ark of God's presence. Everybody could come and see that thing. It's not behind veils. It's not behind veils. And David is there. It's in his backyard. And he's able to worship as he wishes. Okay. I think I'm concluding. I started building some more stuff. This, this is the tabernacle. Uh, this tabernacle of David was rebuilt so that all barriers are removed that keeps man from the presence of God. God said, sacrifices and offerings I would not have. Paul said, go beyond the elementary principles of baptisms. Jesus did the veil torn in two and there's access for all. There's more here, but now uh, let me just uh, look in your Bibles, look in your Bibles of what David discovered. I want you to open your Bible yourself. And, and look at this prophetic David in the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms. Watch what David says, and I shared that with you guys in one of the teachings recently or in a comment, but Psalms 110, Psalms 110, in verse number four. It says, the Lord had sworn and will not change his mind or repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. If you go to verse one, you can see at the top of verse one, if you have that kind of Bible, it says a Psalm of David. David had the revelation, ladies and gentlemen, about Melchizedek. Where did that come from? Where did this come from? So he's revelating, he's intimate with God, he's fellowshipping and inquiring in his temple. And then he, he, he gets a download where it says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. You know, in the New Testament, God was talking to Jesus. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of where? Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, for how long? Forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then from here, you would go, if somebody is looking to study deeper and stuff that I've shared already, now you would jump to Hebrews 7. And Hebrews 7 is going to talk all about this man, Melchizedek, and just blow your mind with who he is. And that's where I'm going to pick up next time. I'm going to pick up on that. I just wanted you to see how David made the connection being an Old Testament figure walking in kingdom now 
in present day Melchizedek order as an Old Testament saint, as a king, priest, and prophet. I'll stop the share. I'll stop the share. Hopefully what that does, this does here, is it helps you plug in to everything that's here because remember some other facts david sprang from the tribe of judah that's where he's born guess where jesus comes from the tribe of judah he's the lion of the tribe of judah jesus and that moses made no mention the book of hebrews said about a priesthood that came from Judah because they only came from Aaron or Levi, which is the Levitical priesthood. But nothing was ever said, the book of Hebrews says, about another priesthood of Judah. What is that all about? Ladies and gentlemen, the Hebrew word for Judah is praise. So you see, the tabernacle of David that's going to be rebuilt emanates from praise. The priest emanate from praise. So I don't know about you, but I pray that you would step back and what's the application tonight? Understanding and receiving an understanding basically that the tabernacle of David, whose ruins must be built up in you and in me, must come through praise and worship and dancing and singing before the Lord. Paul said, making melody in your heart with the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Ghost. Paul talked about it the whole way through. Now you could understand Paul captured that stuff and he was just teaching it in the epistles, which is the apostles doctrine. He was preaching Melchizedek priesthood the whole time. And then finally he opens up his mouth in the book of Hebrews and says, let me tell you all about this man Melchizedek. But all the, the, the epistles, are when it comes to praise and worship and teaching spiritual things, he's teaching from the order of that priesthood, not Levi. Ladies and gentlemen, Levi has no power. Levi is hoping to see God hoping God will forgive their sins for a year, hoping that uh, uh, the high priest doesn't die in his presence, afraid of the Lord. That system no longer exists. It doesn't exist anymore, but people are preaching it, people are teaching it, people are sitting under it, and it has no power to recover, no power to heal, no power to deliver. Find anywhere in the tabernacle where people got healed, people got delivered, any of that stuff. You cannot find it until Saul slipped and ran across a little boy that had the heart of God in him and loved God who could play a harp from a different dimension and cast a devil out. Amazing stuff with David, ladies and gentlemen, how God sets him up. And when you start to look at his lifestyle, you could actually make applications of him being a worshiper and a warrior. Both are there at the same time. I could say a worshiper and a giant killer, but no, David was a vicious killer as well but was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He is a prototype, a prototype that can manifest in the marketplace, manifest in the kingdom, take territory, recover everything, take territory. So if God blessed him and said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and dominate, you can find all of those principles in David's life. You can find all of it. So a study of his life, why God said there will never fail a man to sit on your throne, David. So in spite of his crazy living and crazy life that you read about, God still made a covenant with him. Why? Because he was a man after God's heart, a man that knew how to repent, and a man that walked in revelation knowledge and applied it. He applied that to his life. 
So I would pray and hope that you stir it up because many of you, you've read your Bibles and you've read about David, but now in light of this understanding, David takes on a whole different dimension of understanding for us because he is also a type of Christ in the Old Testament. He's representing priest. Christ is our high priest. King, Christ is king of kings, right? Prophet, the Bible called Jesus a prophet. So David is walking in all three of those dimensions at the same time and has access to God anytime he wants. Not like Levi, the Levitical priesthood is still functioning somewhere out there, but David is in the place, ladies and gentlemen, where I need to talk to God right now. And he goes in the presence of God right in the face of the, of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, and does not die. Does not die. Does not die. And he wants to demonstrate to the people, you can access God. So a new and living way David is teaching the people of his time you don't have to be afraid of God. You will not die in his presence. Come, let us worship, follow me. And I found a picture, I should have took it, uh, but it shows David dancing and the people watching and then the priest are dancing with him while they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. It's a beautiful picture. But they, you can see the dancing and the tambourines and the clapping and all this stuff as the ark is making its way in the city of David. It's an incredible sight to see, ladies and gentlemen. So I don't know about you, but will you add tonight? I'm trying to help you. Add tonight. Get up off your hiney and start praising God, lifting your hands play some music, dance before the Lord, jump, do whatever it is, do your thing. You know, I'm, I'm the cool type. I just go from side to side, you know, I just go from, but, but I'm still, I still, he, he still know where I'm coming from, right? I can't jump like some of y'all young people and all that stuff. And I'm not the nervous type. So I, I just do it cool, you see, but, but I'm still praising him. And I'm trying to tell all of y'all, you need to get out and lift up your hands and really violently go into the presence of the Lord. Not a show off in the congregation, even though you should do it there, but it emanates from your personal worship. Your personal worship. Clapping your hands. You hear clapping in our home. I'm telling you, you hear talking loud in our home and praising God. You hear that over here where I'm at. I pray that you're doing that. So re-erect, at least for now, just with this understanding, the tabernacle of David that has fallen down, meaning the people stop worshiping God. God says, I'm going to get people back up. And they're going to start to worship me again. Old Testament pictures, I think it's 2 Chronicles 20, 20, where the people literally, the, the, the king, they were in trouble. They were getting ready to go to war. Uh, 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 they were getting ready to be defeated. Uh, they were in trouble. And so a prophet came along. I don't have all the story in front of me right now, but he said, listen, set it up this way. Put the praisers in front. So you had people without weapons, natural weapons of war. But people that went forth and began to dance and praise and worship the Lord, and the Lord broke out on their enemies. I want to tell somebody here tonight, you want to see God break out on your enemies? Begin to just worship God. Get into his presence again and begin to cry out Add heavy duty praise and worship to your closets. It's going to bring joy to you. It's going to bring laughter to you. It's going to bring hope to you. It's going to bring breakthrough to you when you start to do that as a priest. It is a qualification for a priest that a priest knows how to enter into his courts with what? Thanksgiving and with praise, which is the fruit of your lips. So it's critical that we get that back. Let's re resurrect that again in our lives. 
and begin to worship and praise. Hopefully this little excerpt in teaching concerning King David will stir you up. Hopefully the release tonight, the intent of my prayer all day today was, Lord, let it be imported into this group tonight that their praise and their worship will be stirred up fresh again that they walk away from this teaching with an application to add that to their life. Well, God, see, praise and worship by yourself proves that you believe God is up in this room eating up what I'm doing, that this pleases him, that this is ministry unto the Lord. Wake that up again. Wake up again your ministry unto the Lord. I'm going to stop.